Clever sleuthing reveals the genetic key that led to modern corn. A profile of Y.C. Fung, considered the father of biomechanics. And how can radar be an aid to more efficient viticulture? All on this edition of On Beyond. The development of modern agriculture is one of the landmark events in human history. In the Americas, the domestication of corn, or maize, is of particular significance. It is believed that early farmers, between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago, developed corn from teosinte, a wild grass that grows throughout Mexico and parts of Central America. Research at the University of California, San Diego, by biologists Bob Schmidt and Andrea Galavati, in collaboration with University of Wisconsin scientist John Dobley, is providing tantalizing genetic clues into corn's remarkable past. The Tiacenti doesn't look uh, like modern maize. It's a, a very bushy, it's a grass species. Maize is a grass also. Tiacenti is a very bushy grass, lots of branches uh, tipped by small inflorescences or small tassel-like structures. Um, it has very small ears, and so if you just, the ear, of course, is probably the, one of the most dramatic differences of modern ear corn over here on the right, and um, inside here is the, um, the ear, if you will, of, of Tiacenti. If we open this up, um, the seeds would all fall out because they also disarticulate, unlike modern maize, which stays on this uh, cob, which makes it very easy for harvesting. It is believed that these Mesoamericans were able to select for certain traits out of the wild Tiacenti populations that led to the development of modern maize. Of course, the original selection didn't give rise to a, an ear of corn that looks like this. A lot of this is due to uh, maize improvement, which has happened in, say, the last hundred years, as opposed to maize domestication, which was responsible for uh, the changes in these really hard seeds of Tiacenti, which are the seed itself is enclosed in a uh, fruit case. Uh, as opposed to the naked seeds that exist in maize, and that certainly was something that was selected for uh, by these uh, early uh, agronomists. We also know that a number of domesticated crops, if we go back to the wild ancestors, they tend to be a lot more branched, and it's thought that a reduction in branching is probably contributed to the funneling of more resources into fewer branches, into fewer fruits or fewer seeds in this case, so that those would be bigger and, and more easily harvested by um, those early agriculturalists. Um, so a reduction in branching has been seen for uh, a number of domesticated crop species, including maize. As a lab, we are mainly interested in uh, understanding how the architecture of maize is established. So we want to identify the key factor in the development of a maize plant. Because the researchers were interested in branching, one very striking mutant, called Berenstock, caught their attention. Uh, the Berenstock mutant uh, is really interesting because it's a single mutation that caused um, the complete inability of the plant to produce uh, any lateral um, branches. Without branches, maize is a sterile, it's a sterile stalk. Uh, with no ear and no flowers and no branches at all. So this was a really interesting mutation for us to investigate further and uh, that's why we started to isolate the gene. The Berenstock 1 mutation was first described by a scientist, a uh, maize geneticist by the name of Emerson back in the 1920s. Um, this was discovered among some materials um, that were brought back from collections down in South America. So it was a spontaneous mutation that uh, gave rise to this barren stock uh, appearance to the corn. It was called barren stock one because it was the first one that had that sort of appearance associated with it. In the barren stock one mutant, as you see here, notice the tassel. There are no branches and there are no spikelets. These little units here that bear the flowers. So it's completely void of any branches or any spikelets, no, f no flowers at all. And you notice, obviously, as you scan down the plant, there are, no, there are no ears. You don't see an ear anywhere on there. And that's why it was called barren stalk, because it was completely barren. Understanding what was wrong with the barren stalk mutants meant determining the DNA sequence of the defective gene. 
This entailed isolating and copying, or what the researchers call cloning, the Berenstock 1 gene. Our lab was interested in trying to clone this Berenstock 1 gene so that we could learn a lot more about that gene. We could study it genetically, but we wanted to study it at a molecular level. So there are various ways we can try to do that in maize, and we were attempting that. Um, while at the same time, there was a scientist in Japan, Junko Kayazuka, who was trying to clone uh, a gene in rice, which when mutated, causes a uh, an appearance of the rice which has a lot of similarities with the kind of mutant we see when the Berenstock 1 gene is mutated in corn, namely that the inflorescences in rice have a reduction in branching and don't form uh, the florets and are, are basically barren. So there was a lot of similarities there. She was able to work her way to this gene called LAX1 and we speculated about the possibility that this LAX gene and the Berenstock 1 gene in maize might be one and the same. Certainly the, the appearance of the rice and the appearance of the maize when those genes are mutated had some similarities associated with them. And we know that rice and maize share a common ancestor going back probably 50 to 55 million years ago. So she agreed to give us the lax gene from rice to see whether we could demonstrate that indeed Berenstock 1 and lax 1 were one and the same. And to sort of make a long story short, um, that's what Andrea was able to do. The prediction then is that we should see changes in that mutant gene. We should see some alteration there because we know that gene doesn't function. That's what gives the mutant appearance of the, the barren stalk, the, the corn without the ear or the branches. And indeed, Andrea was able to do that. And he could find that there was uh, an alteration in that gene. There turned out to be a, um, an insertion in the regulatory regions of that gene, which affected the ability of that gene to be expressed normally. Once they had isolated the Berenstock gene, Schmidt and Galavati could compare the DNA sequence of Berenstock in maize and its ancestor. The work of um, John Dobley uh, at the University of Wisconsin has shown that um, the differences in architecture between maize and Teosinte we can be traced back to just as few as five major regions in the genome. Barenstock 1 maps in one of these uh, regions, one of these five major regions. So we thought it was, uh, was interesting to test the hypothesis that Barenstock 1 was actually a gene that was selected during the domestication process. If the gene were important in the domestication process, then these early agronomists would have selected for that particular gene, perhaps in combination with a few other genes, um, that um, were able to orchestrate these differences in what we call a phenotype or the appearance of that wild tia senti that, that made it a little more useful in those early agricultural practices that were going on. So it's anticipated then that those genes would have been selected, it's artificial selection, and they would have been prevented from recombining with the other variants that would be there in the wild TSNT population. So the prediction then is that if we go in and molecularly look at the genetic variation at Berenstock 1 in modern maize and compare it to, its, to what's in the wild population of TSNT, if this gene was really under selection, we would anticipate a reduction in the variability so when we assayed for this, we saw that yes indeed, in Tiacenti there are many different variants or forms of this Berenstock 1 gene. Only one of those numerous variants that are still out there in the wild um, made it into modern maize. And this was a rather unprecedented um, occurrence to see that all modern maize inbreds contain this same form of the Berenstock 1 gene. So that doesn't prove that it was a gene of selection, but it's certainly a, a, a smoking gun. In addition to providing insight into the genetic changes that gave rise to corn, the researchers are continuing to study the role played by the Berenstock gene in plant development. In normal corn, the Berenstock gene is activated in lateral meristems, tiny groups of cells analogous to stem cells in animals. Lateral meristems generate branches, such as those in the tassel. 
An understanding of the sequence of genetic events in these meristems that lead to branch formation can be applied in modern breeding programs. We know that uh, Barnstorff 1, the gene, is uh, fundamental, is necessary for the creation of lateral meristem. What we still don't know is if it's sufficient to form lateral meristem. That means if we take the gene and we express the gene in a different place where it's not supposed to be expressed in, in, a, in a normal plant, can we create a new meristem? If that's the case, if Barnstorff 1 is sufficient to uh, create and nucleate the uh, lateral meristem, then we would expect that driving the gene in different places will form new meristems. And that, that experiment is possible. Uh, it's a possible experiment that we are going to do, and uh, that eventually will tell us if uh, Barnstorff 1 is, um, is by itself sufficient to nucleate the formation of lateral meristems. Modern breeding programs um, have focused on on branching and have tried to modify the overall architecture of our domesticated plants in various ways, usually to make them more efficient at gathering light energy or to obtain a form that is more amenable for mechanical harvesting. Uh, if you look at modern maize, we have this single stalk with a couple of very compressed branches on which those ears and we now are able to grow uh, corn in, at, at very high yields um, because you can pack it so well into a, a limited amount of space without compromising its ability to produce those large ears. There are still efforts at trying to modify plant architecture and you can imagine also if, if we could understand the nuances of how you how a plant is able to um, to orchestrate the formation of new branch sites, um, then in theory we should be able to exercise some control over how that occurs and so we could modify agricultural plants in various ways or maybe horticultural plants to get novel phenotypes that would be attractive for house plants or plants in the garden or whatever. And so from a practical point of view to be able to understand how to perhaps manipulate that pathway could be of a lot of use agronomically and horticulturally. Long life should be stress-free. <laughs> <laughs> to anyone who has worked with Yuan Cheng Fang, it's not his intelligence, nor his prolific writing, nor his long list of honors that best define him. No, it's his <laughs> laughter. I heard this loud laugh, and then shortly I saw a tall man, uh, a tall uh, to Chinese standards. Pin Dong recalls the first time he ran into Professor Fung on the Caltech campus in 1962. Dong had just arrived from Taiwan. And then the next day, I started to work, work for him. And then for the next 40 or more years, I have been working with him. Professor Y.C. Fung, Bert Fung, to many of his American friends and colleagues, retired from full-time teaching at the University of California, San Diego in 1990. But he still goes to his office and lab almost every day at UCSD's Jacobs School of Engineering newly built bioengineering hall's main auditorium is named after him. Fung was one of the first visionaries to recognize that engineering principles and technologies could be used to develop innovative ways to diagnose, treat, and prevent human disease. President Clinton awarded him the National Medal of Science in 2000 for his pioneering work in not one but two fields, bioengineering and aeronautics. He is widely recognized as the father of biomechanics. Born near Shanghai in 1919, Fung's studies and early career were defined by war. In 1937, I applied to the National Central University, and during the examination, the Japanese invasion of Shanghai started, so I didn't finish the examination there. He still won admission and after college took a job designing airplanes at China's Bureau of Aeronautical Research. Fung also entered a competition to do graduate school in the United States. He was offered a scholarship at Caltech in 1943, but didn't arrive in Pasadena until the end of the war, two years later. By then, Caltech said the scholarship funds had dried up. So I arrived actually with no position whatsoever. Undaunted, Fung began working in a lab and auditing classes. Eventually, he received his Ph.D. in aeronautics and mathematics in 1948 and joined the aeronautics faculty at Caltech. His early focus was on structural dynamics and aerodynamics. My specialty in aeronautics is uh, in the so-called aeroelasticity, dynamics of airplane or spaceships, encountering sudden 
disturbance from environment, like a flying in an airplane into a storm, into a, a stormy cloud. Fung published his first textbook on the subject in 1955, but two years later, his life changed. His mother, still in China, was diagnosed with glaucoma. Fung began studying physiology. He translated the latest Western medical texts and sent them to his mother's doctor. It got me involved in uh, literature, in, in medicine, and literature, in biology. And from that beginning, gradually my interest in biology kept on growing. Fung began harnessing his knowledge of force, motion, flow, stress, and strength from aeronautics and applying it to better understand how the body works. Uh, Dr. Fung certainly is a trailblazer uh, starting this new field by merging biology, medicine, and engineering. Fung decided to leave aeronautics behind. In 1966, together with two Caltech colleagues, Marcos Intelieta, who is still on the faculty at UCSD, and the late Benjamin Zweifach, Fung moved to San Diego to start and build UCSD's bioengineering program, which has remained among the top three in the nation to this day. Dr. Fung was the founder of this program. Without him, we wouldn't have the bioengineering program here. His impact is not only on the fundamental research and basic scientific knowledge, but also on the delivery of health care to benefit patients. Fung's textbooks on biomechanics went on to define the new discipline. His insights about the structure and physiology of lungs led to improved treatment of edema and other lung injuries. And his pioneering work on tissue engineering paved the way for breakthroughs such as artificial skin, cartilage, and blood vessels. This is a uh, test bed for cells. His current research is on the remodeling of cells under stress and the changes that occur in blood vessels when blood pressure is suddenly increased or decreased. Fung has received dozens of awards and honorary professorships and is one of only seven people who are concurrently members of all three U.S. academies. Translate means you are the tallest peak of the mountains. All the hills around it look small. He is such a giant. A, a person who are so brilliant and also so kind and so gentle, I think that's a rare combination. That's what Professor Fung is. Fung also helped inspire generations of students and colleagues, many of them, like him, from China. He led the way, together with uh, several other Chinese scientists, uh, to encourage the next generation, such people like myself and the later generations to come made an example, a role model for all of us who come after him. So he has tremendous impact on the Chinese scientists and engineers in this country. And I would say all the Asian scientists and engineers as well. On the grounds of the Robert Mondavi Winery in Napa Valley, UC Berkeley researchers are looking for something valuable. Not hidden treasures, but hidden moisture in the soil. They're using a technology called ground penetrating radar, or GPR. It's commonly used for locating buried objects, but researchers are testing another use for GPR, mapping soil moisture beneath the Earth's surface. UC Berkeley professor of civil and environmental engineering, Yoram Rubin, is the lead investigator of the radar mapping project, funded by the National Science Foundation and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We would like to say in science that we have a problem and then we look at a solution. In fact, here we had the solution and we, we looked at a problem. Rubin applied his high-tech solution to a problem faced by all winemakers, how to better monitor soil moisture in their vineyards. Wine grapes are sensitive to the moisture they receive. Too little water and the vine can get overstressed to the point where the crop is lost. Too much water leads to leafy vegetation at the expense of berry ripening and fruit quality. Having accurate information about the soil's water content would help winemakers grow quality wine grapes. The technique that wineries now use to measure soil moisture involves taking soil samples from different spots within a vineyard. However, this technique is costly and invasive and doesn't always generate an accurate picture of the soil moisture, since the soil from one part of the vineyard may be quite different from the soil just a few meters away. That's why Daniel Bosch, director of vineyard operations for Mondavi, embraced the GPR research. With the GPR, we're trying to get two things out of it. First of all is a understanding of water use. 
So as we have a better understanding of water use, we can control berry size better. And berry size is important because of its relationship to wine quality. The smaller the berry, in general, the more concentrated the wine, especially in red varieties. The other one we're trying to do is we're trying to get a, a larger picture of the entire vineyard. Rather than just one vine, you know, how is 10,000 10, vines or 1,000 vines or 100 vines looking? And as we understand that, we can make what is a better understanding of the average and a better understanding of each sort of unique spot. So some areas of the vineyards are weak and some are strong. They're more vigorous, they have more water. And as we understand that, we can then adjust our vineyard practices to make them more uniform. UC Berkeley research engineer Susan Hubbard has been field testing the GPR at Mondavi and Dellinger wineries. So this is the ground penetrating radar unit we've been using. It's commercially available off the shelf. This particular one is from Sensors and Software in Canada. And um, it has several different components. This is a transmitting antenna. It sends a high frequency electromagnetic signal into the ground. That wave, the speed of that wave travels as a function of moisture content. The signal is detected by this receiving antenna right here. And actually, the signal looks very similar to a seismogram. We see a lot of squiggles, um, and it's uh, received as a function of time. Um, what we have right here is an odometer. This is, has a little recording, uh, little dials on the front part of it, and it's, we can set that and tell the system how frequently to collect data. For example, right now, we're having it collect measurements every five centimeters as we're walking through the vineyard. It's all connected via these coaxial cables back here to um, just our recording system. We have a console that really is um, taking, taking information for the computer. It's sending it to the GPR system. The GPR system is sending it back to the console. It's all run by just a standard 12-volt marine battery. And um, we have a, just a laptop right here where we can collect the data. What we have recorded on the screen is just an example of a GPR signal. So we can look at this out in the field and um, process it a little bit. Typically, we take it back to our offices and play with it. Um, and that's where we really use the signal to estimate moisture content. Hubbard drags the GPR up and down each row of the vineyard, skimming the soil's surface. In just one block of the vineyard, she collects 20,000 data points about soil moisture five or 10 centimeters apart. Ground penetrating radar sends a high frequency electromagnetic signal into the ground, and it turns out that the velocity of the signal is very sensitive to soil moisture. Um, and so, our objective was to use uh, two components of the ground penetrating radar signal both a ground wave that travels from the receiving antenna to the transmitting antenna at the very near ground surface, the very shallow subsurface, say the top 20 centimeters of the soil. Another part of the signal travels deeper and is reflected off of units, say, soil layers that might have different moisture content. The reason we use different frequencies are because um, higher frequency signals uh, will give higher resolution, but it actually won't penetrate very deep, whereas lower frequency signals will penetrate a little bit deeper. The data generated so far has impressed Mondavi's Bosch. It's like having a candle in a cave and you're looking at all the walls. I mean, this is going to give us a 3D image of what's going on with fairly great depth. In the future, the soil moisture data may help Bosch and other viticulturists better determine which grape variety to grow on certain plots of land. For instance, Cabernet Sauvignon and other red wine grapes are planted in drier soils, while Chardonnay and other white wine grapes do best in moister soils. This kind of targeted approach, Hubbard says, saves water and energy. Winemakers can give the vines just the amount of moisture they need. GPR also helps the environment by reducing agricultural pollution. If you give a, a plant more water than it needs, more water than it can use by its root system, then the rest of that water is flushed into the ground and ultimately into the water table and into um, our groundwater from which we extract and, and use for drinking. And so if there are pesticides um, associated with the farming, which there often are, then those pesticides are all also flushed down into the groundwater. Hubbard says many of the crops grown in California's orchards can also benefit from the soil moisture data. But first, the ground penetrating radar will have to be a adapted to work in larger fields. 
Ultimately, what we would like to see is that these equipment can be hooked to the back of tractors, um, and in the front of the tractors we have a computer and a GPS system, and the tractors can go up and down the rows doing their traditional farming, but at the same time they're getting information about moisture content as they're pulling the system behind. That's a few years down the road. For now, Hubbard and others are focused on the vineyards, finding out just how much water will make good wine. This is Julie Huang in Napa Valley.